The year is 2021. Gaming technology has and continues to advance at an unprecedented rate. Each hair, wrinkle, and pore can now be rendered in real time and to a shockingly accurate degree. Megabytes the size of a room have turned into terabytes so small they can fit in the palm of our hand. 2D sprites to 3D models so realistic they're almost indeterminate from reality. Light simulated so authentically would think for once we were actually outside. Then there's virtual reality, which is only just getting started. It's at this point in time that a development studio with hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, armed with hundreds of veteran game developers, and backed by a trillion dollar corporation, is currently having issues adding a team deathmatch playlist to their game. The game had been built from the ground up to be a platform for the next 10 years of the franchise and the developers are currently suggesting the user interface of the game is bringing the feasibility of a Team Deathmatch playlist into question. The state of things isn't looking great, but to understand just how massive a tumble this franchise is having, we have to go back to the start. The year is 1997, and Bungie is a small but fairly well-known development studio in the PC and Mac market. They're located in central Chicago, having recently moved from the south side, where they were situated behind a crack house. Regardless, they're now starting work on their next game. Now there are only around 50 people working at Bungie at this point. However, their project gets the attention of Steve Jobs. He's interested. And at Macworld in 1999, he has a little something to show off. Now at this point, Halo is a top-down, real-time strategy game, but the people at Bungie are liking it so much, they keep wanting to get closer to the action. It then becomes a third-person shooter. Closer. A first-person shooter? Perfection. Also, it turns out that the Macworld presentation had turned a few heads, and now Microsoft are interested. They slip Bungie some money, and in 2000, they're theirs. Bungie packs up and moves to Washington, and Halo is repurposed as an exclusive launch title for the original Xbox. Steve hears about this, and he's not happy. He apparently calls the CEO of Microsoft directly and has a go at him for about half an hour. But nonetheless, on November 15th, 2001, the original Xbox comes out and Halo ships with it. Players boot up the game and jump into the campaign. The year is 2552 and humanity is now in space. We jump into the shoes of Master Chief Petty Officer John Halo. He's brought out of cryosleep on the Pillar of Autumn, a ship in the midst of fleeing a planetary invasion from the Alien Covenant. Cortana, Chief's new AI, has led it to a mysterious, ancient ringworld called Halo. Oh, that's why they call it that. And they land on it via an escape pod. The campaign is action-packed, interestingly plotted. The levels are huge and open and it's accompanied by a score literally channeled from the heavens by Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore. The multiplayer only had three to four people working on it for a total of six months and was actually on the verge of being completely cut just two days before the game was finished. However, it made it in and turns out it's a smash hit. People system link their Xboxes together to form 16 player LAN parties and go crazy. Design wise, Halo's multiplayer is an arena shooter. There's no sprint and no weapon loadouts. Want a better weapon? Better get out there and find one. There's also a ton of vehicles to play around with. Scorpions, banshees, ghosts. See that truck? That's a fan favorite. There's a ton of interesting maps and a huge variety of game modes to play on them. Slayer, Capture the Flag, King of the Hill, and more. Fancy something with a bit more bang? Bigger maps, more vehicles, and 16 players in big team battle has you sorted. 
The formula for Halo multiplayer is set, and it's a blast. But we're not done yet. Combat Evolved's mechanics are also revolutionary. Before Combat Evolved, FPS's on console were more or less a complete clusterfuck. <laughs> Each stick on your controller would control both movement and aiming at the same time, making aiming incredibly awkward. However, in Halo, the left stick is solely for movement, the right solely for aiming. There's also an aim assist feature, so now you can actually hit something. In most games at the time, you'd spend a ton of time fuffling through the arsenal of weapons you'd amassed while playing. But in Halo, you can only have two at a time. Just hit that Y button and unload. The health system. In Halo, you have a shield that recharges, so you're no longer forced to scour around for a health kit to keep playing, like most games at the time. A mechanic now ubiquitous in shooters. Add the best graphics, enemy AI, and physics of any console shooter at the time. And yeah, this game wasn't half bad. And so, the game sells. Bigly. It ships more than 5 million copies in the first three years, and launches the Xbox with it. Microsoft's newly acquired investment is looking good. But first, I live in my parents' house in a generic English suburb on the first floor. My name is Big Boss. I'm 25 years old. I believe in taking care of myself, a balanced diet, a rigorous exercise routine, and good wireless earbuds. In the morning, if I'm a little bored, I'll put on my Raycons while doing my stomach crunches. Thanks to their sweat resistance, I can do a thousand now. On the off chance the batteries are running low, before my shower I'll take them off and charge them. Fully charged, they'll be good for 8 hours, with 32 more still in the case. I then reapply them while I prepare the rest of my routine. I mostly use the balanced sound profile. It stabilises the natural highs and lows of the songs that aren't mixed exactly to my liking, for a warm, balanced sound. When I'm listening to something else, like a podcast, I'll use the pure sound profile. It's crystal clear, and I can hear everything. Then lastly, I'll use the bass sound profile, usually for when a song is particularly dirty. The seamless touch controls make changing between them effortless. In noise isolation mode, there is an idea of external sound. Some kind of abstraction. But there is no real sound. Only an entity. Something illusory. And though I can hide my confused gaze, and you can shake my hand and see me nod my head, and maybe you can even sense I'm listening. I simply can not hear. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash big boss to get 15% off your Raycon purchase today. When Bungie started developing Combat Evolved, it was supposed to be a standalone game. But after its huge sales numbers, Microsoft sees dollar signs. Hey, uh, you got any more of that Halo? And Bungie gets to work. For Halo 2, Bungie gathers round. The ideas are big, ambitious. This game was going to be bigger, better, cooler. However, fast forward about a year or two into development, and problems are surfacing. All right, boys. We've just shown our E3 demo to the world, and they absolutely love it. Here's the thing, our graphics engine doesn't actually work, and we're going to have to scrap the entire game and start from scratch. They tell Microsoft the game has to be delayed by a year and get to work. The crunch is on. They work around the clock building the entire game from the ground up again, shifting the story around and scrapping things left, right and center. In the end, Almost 50% of the game's planned content is cut. Story-wise, they end up axing the entire third act. They're so loaded with work that employees are in office constantly, and Bungie's two side projects have to be killed off entirely to bring more team members onto Halo. In the end, 90% of the final game is made in just 9 months. But in November 2004, after a huge marketing push, Halo 2 is everywhere. It's covered on late night talk shows, news channels, billboards, and it's plastered all over Times Square. And on the 9th, it launches. And despite the development nightmare, they've done it again. 
Halo 2 launches with another highly rated campaign. This time we take the fight to Earth as the Covenant has absolutely no chill for real for real. The campaign fleshes out the story by giving the player a glimpse into the Covenant's side. Where we play half of it as a Covenant elite as he realises that his religion is a lie and that their goal to activate the rings would actually just destroy most of the galaxy. The campaign ends on an infamously controversial cliffhanger due to the game's content cuts. Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, do you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir. No. The music is on par with the first one, apart from one key difference. Some aspects of the campaign are controversial upon reception, but on the multiplayer side, oh boy. Halo 2 is one of the first games to utilise the brand spanking new Xbox Live, and Halo goes online. People from all around the world come together through the wonders of the internet to universally trash talk you and your mother through game chat. Halo 2 also introduces player created custom games, and after matchmaking online, you'll often find yourself with a ton of invites to fun custom lobbies. Halo 2's multiplayer matchmaking is so popular that in 2006, it becomes Major League Gaming's first televised console league. Red vs Blue, an online web series made within Halo 1, has also launched by this point and is quickly becoming one of the most popular web series of all time, eventually landing on Netflix. As a result of all of this, Halo 2 has bigger first day revenues than any movie had ever had at the box office and is sitting at the biggest 24 hours of revenue in entertainment retail history. $125 million in sales, and 2.3 million units sold. Now two for two, Bungie has a proven track record. Microsoft, now drowning in money and sales, commissioned a third game instantaneously. And after three years, in 2007, Halo 3 is served. It's one of the most anticipated game launches of all time, with a colossal ad campaign to go with it. The launch sees queues at almost every game's retailer, and streets filled with people waiting to get their copy. But at midnight on the 25th of September 2007, it launches. Halo 3 flies off the shelves instantly, and first day sales reach as high as $170 million in the US, setting another record for the highest gross of an entertainment product. While some parts of Halo 3's plot and writing is underwhelming. Ma'am, squad leaders are requesting a rally point. Where should they go? To war. Bungie. You just posted cringe. Halo 3 finishes the trilogy off with a bang. A stellar campaign with some of the best missions in the series and an ending to the series with proper closure. Multiplayer is again amazing. A social experience with pre and post game lobbies where everyone has a mic and trash talking is ubiquitous. Halo 3 also adds Forge, a way for players to create their own maps, and Theatre, a way to rewatch and clip previous games. You can also now unlock different armors for your Spartan via achievements, as opposed to just choosing your Spartan's colors like in 2 and 1. Custom games are expanded with a file sharing feature on Bungie.net, with players having their own specific file share pages where they can share and save other screenshots, film clips, and map and game variants. This inevitably ends in interesting uploads. Halo 3 goes on to sell more than 4 million copies in the first few weeks, and Halo is everywhere. People that never even so much as picked up a controller had heard the theme, oh, I like it, and knew John Halo. Halo had become more than a game. It was a cultural phenomenon. However, a month after, Bungie comes out with some news. On October the 5th of that same year, they announced their decision to split with Microsoft and become an independent company. As per the deal, they'd make two more Halo games and then dip. Microsoft would retain all rights to Halo post-split. Bungie had released the smaller spin-off, Halo ODST, a couple of years after 3, but Halo Reach was Bungie's true send-off. Now this game is a bit controversial. New game mechanics like Sprint, 
Some annoying armor abilities and weapon accuracy decay divides the player base and damages the professional scene. Then there's a lack of maps in the game, and a ton of those maps are half assed at best, being made in Forge. The campaign is highly rated, being the prequel to the first game and ending immediately before that game begins, but it's also controversial due to its story heavily deviating from the books. Reach is also jam-packed with features, the player's customization is vastly expanded, a new massive Forge world map, the wave survival mode Firefight returns from ODST, a multiplayer with a variety of maps and game modes, Forge, custom games, and a theatre to film all of it. At this point, the formula for a Halo game had been cemented. It had been almost 10 years of Halo, and Bungie had gone from a small group of friends to a team of less than 50 people in the south side of Chicago, to a fully-fledged AAA world-renowned studio with almost 200 employees that revolutionized graphics, physics, console multiplayer, console control schemes, and general FPS mechanics. They had created something massive, Microsoft's biggest game IP by far. However, they were now gone. Bungie hands Microsoft the keys and says their goodbyes. Immediately after Bungie announces their departure, Microsoft gets to work on finding their replacement. However, instead of taking one of their already established studios and giving them the IP, someone has a brilliant idea. Simply build their own. And 343 Industries is born. Microsoft Game Studios manager Bonnie Ross is assigned studio head, and she gets to work shaping the new studio. They approach devs from a ton of AAA studios. Hey, we're building a team. You son of a bitch, I'm in. And after a couple of years, the team is starting to take shape. First up, Frank O'Connor, previously Bungie's content manager, is now franchise development director. Basically, he's gone from doing odd jobs around Bungie to swaying the direction of the entire franchise. Josh Holmes is creative director of their first game. Previous experience? Working at EA Sports on games like NBA and PGA Tour. And Brian Reed, previously a comic book writer for Marvel, is on board as one of the first game's writers. More on him later. Microsoft had handpicked the next generation of Halo developers, and they were going to make sure the next game would be amazing. From 2007 to 2011, 343 Industries goes from around a dozen people to almost 200. They'd hired developers from over 25 AAA studios, and had spent the last three years working hard on the next game. And finally, at E3 2011, they have something to show off. And people are hyped. People had thought Halo was finished, that the trilogy had ended. But now we had a new one coming out just next year and it was from this new, mysterious studio. 340 people now on the job, and a cost of about $40 million. But on the 6th of November 2012, Halo 4 goes live. It's a mixed bag. Turns out that before making Halo 4, 343 sat down and had a talk. They'd looked at Halo 3. How can we follow on from this? Make this even better? Hmm. What did people like? Iconic art style? That music that everyone loved? Innovation and trend setting? Right, this everything? Let's change all of it. The iconic music? Gone. Game design? Gone. Art style? Gone. And why does the Covenant look completely different? And horrible? Chief went to sleep like this, so why did he wake up like this? Left, right and centre, things are just… wrong. The leadership at 343 is also adamant that it's important to not just follow Call of Duty, which is taking off massively at the moment. Hold on. What's that? That's called a kill streak. Hmm… Loadouts? Write that down. On the campaign side of things, it's divisive. 
On one hand, it's a deeper, more personal story about the Master Chief and Cortana. On the other hand, the plot is convoluted and makes little sense, and the mission layout and game design is abhorrent. The new enemies are a drag to fight. Used half of your ammo on this tanky knight? Unlucky. He's just teleported away and regained all of his health. As a result, only long-range weapons are really viable on higher difficulties, and ammo runs out awfully quick. Oh, and almost every new character is absolutely insufferable. I thought you'd be taller. Bruh. The overall mood is also just different. Gone are the witty one-liners and humor. Oh, I know what the ladies like. And in their place, pure, unadulted melodrama. There has to be another way. I, I mean, I know what you mean, Tom. And I won't see you court-martialed over that woman. The Covenant looks different. Human soldiers look like literal toys. And Spartans are now incredibly ugly plastic Power Rangers. The music also has a totally different feel. When it comes to the multiplayer, Frank O'Connor had specifically talked about not copying COD. Let's look more into that. There's a new system in multiplayer that rewards doing well with better weapons. It's the same as killstreaks. There's a new system where you can assign yourself special attributes during games. It's the same as perks. You can also choose what weapons and grenades you start the game with. It's the same as loadouts. There's also a new story mode called Spartan Ops. It's the same as Spec Ops. Sprint is also no longer an armor ability and is now a default mechanic of the game, just like another game. This changes the integral dynamic of Halo's gameplay and the game is faster paced and the maps larger due to the fact. Even the control scheme of the game itself, straight from Call of Duty. They're the same picture. Then there's the host of weapon balancing issues, things like file share not working at launch. There's few maps, Theatre and Forge are both lackluster, and actually a downgrade from Halo Reaches, and there's no firefight. They would finally fix the file share issues in late January, three months after release. The weapon imbalance isn't properly addressed until months after that. However, on the hype and brand recognition alone, the game sells vast amounts of copies, selling even quicker than Halo 3. One issue. People are not sticking around. After just one week, the game's population craters to half of day ones. In total, Halo 4 lasts a whole two months in the top three of the Xbox Live games. Halo 3 didn't fall out of the top three until Halo Reach released. That was three years after its release. Roughly a year after release, Halo 3 had a 1.1 million peak population day. Reach had a 900,000 peak population day after the same amount of time. Halo 4 clocks in at 20,000. 343, not off to a good start. Before the launch of the next Halo game, 343 announces the Master Chief Collection. This includes Combat Evolved, which 343 had already remastered, a brand new Halo 2 remaster, with new graphics, music, audio, and creamy Blur Studios animated cutscenes, and Halo 3 all bundled together into a single game for the Xbox One, combining six years of Halo into one package. The 11th of November 2014 comes around, and the MCC launches, with Halo 2 launching exactly as it shipped 10 years ago. What is it? More brutes? Worse.
but get past all of that and actually make it into a game? Well, there are issues here too. If you're the host of a lobby, you can boot anyone in the game out at any time, <laughs> kick out everyone on the other team, and you've just won a game. For players playing competitive ranked, this is a big problem. But hold on, didn't 343 claim that games would run on dedicated servers before launch? All running at 1080p, 60 frames per second, on dedicated servers. Frank O'Connor comes out and says that, yes, your games normally do run on dedicated servers, but sometimes they would fall back to peer-to-peer -peer networking. The ability to kick people out of the game was simply due to a UI bug. One issue. MCC doesn't have any of the infrastructure for peer-to-peer -to, -peer to actually work properly. For example, host migration. The system that kicks out hosts when their internet isn't strong enough to host a stable lobby. In the MCC, this is completely absent. Your host's uploading his latest YouTube Let's Plays? Unlucky. You're playing the rest of the entire game lagging everywhere. The host just gone to the dashboard? Your screen is now pitch black until he comes back. The host just left? Well, the game's over entirely. They release a few fixes over the next few months, and then port ODST over and release it for free to say sorry. Sorry. But the game is still completely fucked, and remains in an abhorrent state for years to come. 343 pretends to forget they've ever launched the MCC, and get together again for the next Halo. Okay guys, see this? People hate this. We can do better. And they make it clear in interviews and articles, they'd heard us, and we're going to get it right this time. They say they've learned from their mistakes. It won't happen again. And this was going to be the return to Halo. The music was back, the story was epic, and the multiplayer was going to be amazing. Also, all post-launch content is completely free. Oh yeah. Then there's the Hunt the Truth marketing campaign. Chief's gone rogue. He's being hunted by another Spartan. He's in a cloak. People are intrigued. A really well-written Hunt the Truth audio series also comes out about a journalist finding out the truth about the chief going rogue. Nice, the story actually sounds quite cool. And in November 2015, the game hits shelves. And virtually all of Halo 5's marketing is completely irrelevant. Hunt the Truth? An apt name apparently, because there was none here. Instead of the epic chase down of a rogue chief as shown in the marketing, Halo 5 comes packaged with one of the worst stories in a video game to date. What the fuck? First off, in previous games, all you had to do was play the last game and you knew what was going on. But here, haven't read the last three books, the Spartan Lock movie, the series and everything else before playing. Nothing personal, kid. Halo 5 starts off by showing us a team of Spartans we've never met before, bar one and the first cutscene shows them killing off an elite that the entire Halo 4 Spartan Ops campaign had been building up. We then end up playing as these guys for 13 missions of the game, leaving only 3 to play as Master Chief. There are also 7 boss fights in the game, but turns out we're literally fighting the exact same guy in every one. By the end of the campaign, it turns out that Cortana, who died at the end of Halo 4, is now back alive, and she's now evil and causing an AI uprising. For some reason. Bungie literally joked about how bad of a plot twist this was more than a decade earlier. There was an alternate very early of the version of the story where when he rediscovered Cortana, she'd like gone berserk with power and wanted to take over Halo in the universe. What happened to that story? It was too good. <laughs> Five's writing and plot is so awful, it actually causes irreparable damage to the franchise. Head writer Brian Reed gets so much backlash for writing the game he eventually has to step down. The music, however, is a bit better. For the multiplayer, 343 had sat down again. They'd already stripped the art style and the gameplay. What was left? Split screen. A feature that every Halo game to date had included. Perfect. Also, people weren't too happy with the sprint in Halo 4. Okay, we'll keep that in and nerf it a bit. And let's add a ton more things. Advanced movement. This brings ground pound, charge, float thrusters, and clamber. Meaning the movement is now so far removed from Halo that it's a different beast entirely. 
Also, let's get hundreds of armor sets into the game. Let's also outsource all of our armor development to another company. With this much armor being requested, it naturally results in art designers getting desperate and making some questionable designs in an attempt to hit quotas. Some are absolutely terrifying. The Seeker helmet is particularly infamous and memed instantly. Air fryer, speaker, coffee machine, no one knows. Armor customization is also dumbed down to only body armor, helmet, and visor. That's a massive downgrade from four, which let you pick helmet, shoulders, torso, legs, forearms, and visor. Also, again, there's the actual look of it all. Plastic. Plastic everywhere. The iconic rocket launcher from all the way back in Combat Evolved is also now the gutter pipe on your parents' roof. The classic chief armor is in the game, but it seems a little off. We won't get into the ODST armor. The game is also bare. Multiplayer only includes four game modes at launch. This is less than Halo 1 back in 2001 even missing staples like Big Team Battle. There's no Firefight, Custom Games Browser, or Forge at launch either. 343 add these in months down the line and package it in as post-launch support. When Big Team Battle actually does come, all of its maps had been made in Forge, meaning they looked like they were made in Roblox. Jesus Christ. Despite the lack of content, and while being completely different to the rest of the series, the multiplayer is actually quite highly rated. It plays well, has well-designed maps, and is well-balanced and very competitive. There's a new game mode called Warzone, basically a larger scale big team battle on massive maps. This game mode is really well received. However, fans designate it pay to win, as guns are unlocked in rec packs that are buyable with real cash. All customization is also unlocked with the rec pack system, meaning that most armor unlocks are now completely random. Have a problem with this pay to win system? This is 343's response. Uh, wait, won't wreck packs with special weapons break the exquisitely refined balance of arena multiplayer? Secure your noise hole, soldier. Grown ups are talking. Damn it. Right, that was it. Halo fans, Fuck! done. Fuck this shit. It was apparent the dream had come to an end. Halo was over. Okay, this was bad. 343 holds an emergency meeting. Okay, fellas. Halo 5, again, not too great. And fans are leaving us en masse. This next game has to actually deliver. And deliver it would. 21st of February 2017, and Halo Wars 2 comes out. A sequel to the spin off strategy game released in 2009. Is that the old art style? A new story more akin to the games of 1 to 3? Together with a new enemy, The Banished? Cool cutscenes? Non cringe dialogue? What was going on? Now, this game is actually developed by a studio called Creative Assembly, not 343, but nonetheless, things were looking up. The game does away completely with the story of 5 and sets up a decent looking story for Halo 6. And a couple of days after its launch, Bonnie Ross confirms that they'd learned their lesson. Unlike 5, all new Halo games would have split screen. Let's go, boys. October the 23rd, 2017, and 343 announces they'd attempt to fix the MCC again. At this point, the MCC hadn't seen an update in more than two years, and was still completely broken. But almost a year later, in August 2018, their big patch goes live. It's 37 gigabytes big, and it fixes a ton of networking issues, bugs, and completely overhauls the menus. Four years after the game launched, and the game finally actually worked. In March 2019, 343 has another announcement, and this one is big. Fans immediately begin calling local pizza joints, and ordering pizza to 343's offices en masse. Pizza time. So much pizza is being delivered, 343 actually has to tell fans to stop. Of course, the PC version launches with a ton of bugs. One particularly bad one where, if you shoot the floor, it will damage anyone else in the lobby also looking at the floor. Oh, I killed the flag carrier. 
<laughs> I killed the flag here. Vehicles also driving themselves. There are crashes, graphical issues, etc, etc. However, these are quickly patched. It was clear. Something within 343 had seemingly changed. And a sense of cautious optimism was brewing among fans. And with a huge next-gen sequel that would be the platform for the next 10 years of Halo being cooked up behind the scenes, it looked like Halo was finally back on track.